Welcome to the Intercut Podcast, the weekly show going over the TV, movies, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I am your co-host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me, he's perfectly splendid, it's Arturo Zurita! Look, Zach, look, Zach, look, Zach, look, Zach. You know, it's very <laughs> rare that we get stuff, but when we do, uh, they decide to haunt us, and literally <laughs> literally haunt us. Uh, we got this box sent over from um, the good people at Netflix, which the first time they sent us something, it was... Uh, for the, that for, mysterious, like, dark notepad, that diary that sounded like some crazy stalker had just sent you their journal. <laughs> at no point, it was great marketing. At no point did they say it came from Netflix. I, I didn't even know how they got my address. <laughs> this one, at least they asked. They slid into my DMs over on our LME yeah. page on Twitter, and they sent us this this Bly Manor box. I want to show the inner, inner cuties yeah, first. Let me see that bad boy. Bro, this is, this is the craziest thing. Ooh. I'm pretty sure it's haunted. It comes with this right here that pretty much said dead doesn't mean gone, right? I don't know if you can see it right there, Zach. I know you want yeah, it yeah, right yeah. there. Make sure the good people see it right there. Then they, <laughs> I love their watch party thing. Their watch party was like, yo, you want to come to the watch party date? We got it early, but it was like the date was when it released. And then they sent this creepy mask. And I mean, if you've seen the show, no spoilers on what they do there. But I mean, they wear they got this little mask, little porcelain mask. I'm not, I'm not going to do much with this right here. Uh, my mom was over, bro. My mom. <laughs> my mom does not yeah. mess with this stuff right here she was like I don't kind know of what. creepy looking voodoo <laughs> exactly yeah again something part of the show but the coolest one dude the rest is just the rest is just confetti to quote the season one <laughs> cool little box though uh, but it was a little yeah. zippo bro I've never had a zippo and I wanted the zippo so bad and, and it even says something it says the dead same thing that the other thing says dead doesn't mean gone a little creepy but cool and it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> but you told me I had to probably load it, so, but, uh, yeah, yeah, shout out. Thanks, Netflix, for sending us the stuff. Um, Blind Manor, not as good as Hill House, but but still still good. Still good. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. We'll talk uh, about it. We, yeah, uh, it's cool, though, to see the kind of uh, promotions they're doing for that new season. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Blind Manor in a bit. We're also going to talk about Disney, James McAvoy, Pluto TV. Uh, but first, make sure you're subscribed to the Intercut Podcast, either the video podcast on YouTube.com slash Intercut Pod or the audio podcast available on most podcatchers. Also, follow Intercut on social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We are at Intercut Pod. That's Intercut P-O-D. That's short for podcast. And a reminder to go ahead on to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and leave us that much-coveted five star review does a lot to help us out over here art let's start the show the way we started every week with what we are watching what you've been watching the hunting <laughs> the hunting of blind manor did you finish it yeah i finished it uh because we actually have two netflix things there's this and then i'd say the other series that you and i got uh is just as scary but without the haunting part of it, but I don't different know if you want to start. Yeah, for different reasons, and I'm sure this one will be out as well. But uh, Blind Manor, I know a lot of people have been very hyped for it. Um, mm -hmm. It being an anthology series, so this is the exact same cast that he had for the first time around, but this time they are actually adapting Turn of the Screw, right? Yeah. So there's some additions to the cast, and I think there's a couple subtractions too. I think uh, mm -hmm. the main two siblings from the first season of Hill House, yes, uh, don't return here. But it's kind of cool seeing the way he sort of repurposed a lot of his cast members in that uh, American horror story anthology style and that Ryan needs Murphy one. popularized. Uh, but yeah, this you get a it's a much creepier, much more unsettling uh, horror than you the type you get from American Horror Story. Mm -hmm. I think he continues that tradition from Hill House of of just this idea of like a lingering haunting, a uh, uh, something evil right beneath the surface without necessarily that kind of uh, loud campiness that you mm -hmm. get in American Horror Story. This is much more focused on uh, on familial relationships, on traumas, both inherited and given. Uh, and I, I think another thing is that this season is is much more of like a, a romantic tragedy yes. than the horror that we get in the first year. That's what everyone keeps saying. He's like, it's it's a, it's a haunted love story. It's a haunted love mm -hmm. story. It's a haunted love story. And it is that. I, I agree with you. The He's been really good at honing in on that. Like the horror being the tragedy of what they're going through with the broken family in the first. And then in this one, it's like every single person who has a loved one, like <laughs> may or may not end that well. But uh, did you prefer it over the, the season one or the, the first you one? You know, I, I was pretty closely split. 
That's when right. I first we we finished Caitlin and I watching uh, Bly Manor and you know it moved me. I I was moved even to tears a little bit by the ending, to be honest. And it was great. Uh, and then we went back and watched Hill House, and man, there's just some imagery in that first season. Thank that, you. That does not get matched in the second season, which isn't to say that I, I don't think Bly Manor is very good. I do think it's very good. Uh, but some of the, the things that he does, uh, some of the mastery of filmmaking, uh, that, that really chaotic, I think it's episode six of Hill House, where it's only done in like five or six shots for the full, full episode. Big fan. Not necessarily, there's not necessarily anything quite as, uh, amazing as that but i do think the thing that flanagan has reminded me of in with bly manor is just how clever he is in his filmmaking how clever he is in uh subtly manipulating you whether that's through you know the like we're here and then we're not where you uh where a character turns and suddenly they're in a new scene or the repeating elements that he it, the loops are very big in this season yeah. um i just think it's it, it's a really smartly done show even if it isn't necessarily as scary as i th- think that first season was no i agree with you technically speaking the the first one like act the actual camera work like you mentioned mm-hmm. in that first episode or in the first season, uh, I, I think it's superior. And, and you know, the bent neck lady, that whole built mm-hmm. up in the first season is mimicked again over here, you know, but he does it. Uh, he reveals it a lot faster, you know, in, in certain cases for for uh, certain characters. But I did feel like a lot of what happens in Blind Manor, while I do like like it and it's great, it's nine episodes less than the first one. And even then, I don't think it needed to be that long. I think there's a lot of imagery where it's like, did you see this crack? In case you didn't, let me show it to you 27 more times, bro. (laughs) Episode, without telling you what the sequence is, episode 7, 8, and 9 show you the same shot. Episode 7, 8, and 9 show you the same shot over and over and over again. Um, And it's it's just moments where I felt like they could have made it a little bit tighter. Uh, mm-hmm. But nonetheless, I still think it's a good addition, and I feel like you know, like we mentioned it with it being an anthology, and obviously FX is going to take back all of their stuff. So I feel like Netflix is is really looking at, at putting money into uh, a man who already has his crew. You know, like one one of the actresses is his wife. He's always good at working with the same people who he has in his in his cast and his crew yeah, and bringing them back. So third movie or show with Carla Gugino uh, on Netflix. So, so. Uh, I'm excited to see what they what they do in the future, whether it be an adaptation or even something something original, because it's just The Haunting of Whatever. So it's a beautiful way to mm-hmm. title them, The Haunting of Whatever. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of like this approach, and I'd be really interested to see if he'd be back for a third season of it, even if uh, maybe the second season it wasn't quite as good. I, I like I, like we've been saying. I think there's a lot to really like about that second season. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it really clicked together by the fifth episode when we're yes. uh, following their their housekeeper. I forget her, her name in the show. Searching um, up, and it's it's such a disorienting episode, mm-hmm. but kind of clicks together. Um, basically what's happening and the types of basically the types of story we should be following because uh, they're giving you all these kind of like like false clues in yeah. a way. Uh, and I think it becomes so it becomes much clearer by that fifth episode, which is to me the standout episode of Bly Manor. Uh, character was Mrs. Gross, uh, played by Tanya yeah, Miller, yeah. Who, who I thought was a standout. Tanya Miller just killed it. Yeah. Her well, again, and, one of the, even Owen, one of the, yeah, yeah, to, right? to me too. Those were my two favorite additions to the cast, and uh, they were excellent in this season. Keep them for the third. What did you think about the other Netflix show I haven't gotten around to yet, Grand Army? Oh, okay, so I'm two episodes towards the end. Grand Army, it had a crazy teaser for it, and it looked like it wanted to be, you know, Netflix needed a euphoria, and they're like, let's get that. I will say, it does. it's better than 13 Reasons Why. And, that's uh, good. You, you know, <laughs> that's great. I mean, I would hope it's already got controversy on it. Um, and it yep. is also based off of a play, a play called slut that, uh, I think did a little bit, uh, back in 2018, 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And I, am I almost feel because they, it also has an actor from the creator's other play that's about like masculinity and about what, you, you know, the guys have to go through and you kind of see both of those mesh into these, into, the, I think it's an episode series about these high schoolers at Grand Army, this high school where, uh, it begins with a bombing and then everything else, you just follow all of their lives. And, uh, there's certain characters that I've attached to that I really like seeing what they're going through and, and I'm feeling for them. Other characters characters where it does feel a little bit contrived and again i haven't seen the play to know what stuff needed to be changed but um 
it's good. Um, I wanted it to be great. I wanted it to be grand. But so far, I think it's going to be a show that's going to hit with a lot of people, especially because it's got that accessibility on Netflix. You know, a lot of people know about Euphoria, but they don't have access to HBO. Everyone in the grandma got access to, to Grand Army. Right, and right. one of the cool things about it is that a lot of the cast, like, they're new. I was searching them up on um, IMDb. Nothing. They were, they were mm. like, it, it's empty. Uh, Old Lee Jean. She plays Dominique. She's the standout for me so far. Like, easily the standout for me in the series. Um, but we'll see how uh, we'll see how it gets embraced because I know bef- as soon as the trailer dropped, there was people who were working behind the scenes and they were like, nope, there's, there's some shenanigans happening. And I almost feel like we're getting to that day and age where it's like, there are shenanigans that happens in every show. And we're about to right. realize that, that that's, how just, that's how Hollywood works. Yeah, we're definitely shouldn't. getting to a breaking point in terms of uh, like the these stories of potentially Everyone's there got a being phone. abuse or or yeah anything. Uh, there there have been writers from the show Grand Army that have said the the writers of color were ostracized from the writing room and uh, which is crazy. HR called on them and stuff like that. So uh, look out for stories like that too. But uh, just to talk about the show itself, Grand Army. Uh, you know, I think Netflix has been trying to cultivate this young adult audience. They've obviously done so through, you know, the various Noah Centineo movies or The Kissing Booth and stuff like that. Also, to an extent, through shows like On My Block. And uh, there's another one that I, I believe that you liked that only lasted one season. Um, Everything sucks. Uh, yeah, yeah. That right. disappeared. Rest um, in peace. Exactly. So uh, we'll talk about do, you that think, later. do you think this uh, will be another one of those shows that kind of has a has like a strong following of those young uh netflix watchers yes because i think it has uh, you're you're following a dozen characters like you're following mm-hmm. uh, a middle eastern swimmer like he is the jock and they do like this really big thing where it's like yeah boys the jocks middle eastern this time like, I kid you not, that's that's probably one of the things that that they have moments that just work well you know like euphoria had the same consultant from zola and they know how to make things just feel well euphoria has one of the biggest gripes that i have in movies that it's clearly the director having all the kids listen to his music but man they make it work so well this movie mm-hmm. has or the series has those moments where it it it, it you know, the beginning, they start with like a Cardi B song uh, to compare it to another HBO series that decided to use a Cardi B song, Lovecraft. And I, I felt it just did not work. Here it meshes well. And it's almost like playing a part of the score, but it's not the score. It's the kids playing it. It's the opening scene. It's the kids playing it and the, in the locker room. Um, but then you'll, again, get moments where it just feels too hokey and some characters um, and narrative devices. For example, uh, one of the things that carries the show at the beginning and at the end, someone is writing something and it sounds like a threat. You don't know what they're leading to and you also don't know who it is. So that's one of the big things that they're carrying through the show on um, uh, how it's going to climax for the finale. And then mm. I believe it it might be extended to more than one season. So it'll definitely be one of those series if it doesn't get canceled by Netflix or if it doesn't get canceled at all, like on its own. So we'll see. But uh, I think a lot of people are going to like the show. I've been entertained by it, frustrated by it, all the emotions that I'm sure a teen drama wants you to have. And it's better than 13 reasons why. So congrats. Very cool. All right. Very cool. Uh, Interested in still checking that one out. Uh, Anything else that you've been watching recently? Uh, The only one I wanted to mention was a festival pick that I missed and and I really enjoyed called Charm City Kings. Absolutely right. good. The doc, though, fantastic. Have you seen the documentary? Uh, what's it called? Twelve o'clock it boys. The... Twelve o'clock boys. Yeah, Dude. yeah, that's a great one. Wow, like mm-hmm. incredible. Uh, I- I'm working on a whole video for that because I-, I absolutely love the doc, and I was just like breaking down uh, just the way that he shot the the like the the kid because you're following it. Charm City Kings literally is an adaptation of the documentary because in the documentary, you're following this kid named Pug who wants to make it into the group. And the movie takes not just his ambition or the fact that he's a vet or the fact that he's got the red four wheeler or the fact that it's his whole story, honestly, translated into the biopic that um, I know Barry Jenkins worked on uh, for the original script. And then the Smiths came in to help produce Um, my biggest gripe with the movie, though. And why I think it's nowhere near the dock. It's still a really good movie. Again, you just mentioned Everything Sucks. And I think the kid, who is also in Charm City Kings, does a much better job at a role like that than he did in trying to do a Baltimore accent. And I mm. then searched it out because I was like, all right, maybe, I don't know. I've only, I've only passed through Baltimore a couple times. Yo, 
I'm being nice on the kid. The Baltimoreans or, or, or however y'all identify yourselves, that they are grilling this kid for it. Um, but Meek did great. Meek did well. Uh, like yeah, Meek I was about to ask, how was Meek? You haven't caught it yet? No, I still haven't. It's on HBO uh, Max now it's like, for yeah, those who haven't seen it. It's on HBO Max, and I wish I would have been able to catch it uh, in a theater because they, they shoot the, the, the biking scenes beautifully. Um, again, they're called the twelve o'clock boys because they they hit that thing at twelve o'clock. Like this isn't this isn't a this isn't a wheelie. This is all the way up to the heavens. Um, yeah, he is fantastic in it. I I do think that they make his ending a little too contrived. And then I searched up, and mm. the producer practically said that there was a purpose for it. And I was like, oh, okay. As long as it, it made sense after after he explained it without spoiling what happens yeah. in the ending. But it is a beautiful story because the idea is that these guys find solace in being able to ride these bikes right and mm -hmm. it is the one moment uh, according to the rules in baltimore where they cannot get arrested while they're on a bike does it cause a lot of commotion and a lot of bumping and things that should not be happening with the police force there of course but at the same time it's this juxtaposition of you are your at as soon as you step off the bike you can get arrested but while you're on it you are the freest you can possibly be yet it's considered an illegal crime and it's just like I think the movie captures that, but the documentary literally captures that. <laughs> it literally yeah, captures that, yeah. and I highly recommend it as well. I know that one at least is playing on Criterion, I believe, um, but it should be 12 available. 12 O'Clock Boys. Yeah, 12 O'Clock Boys. It's fantastic, and it's even avail it's available on YouTube as well, I know. But uh, yeah, Very check cool. those out. Yeah, man, uh, Charm City Kings was one of those movies that I think we were really excited to catch, uh, but we didn't watch it at Sundance because we figured it's Our about rule. to be in theaters in Our April. <laughs> <laughs> and and then the world changed. I actually, uh, I had a a press screening in New York. I, I that I had requested a spot for. Really? And then I had to get told that we're canceling all the screenings for the foreseeable future. So I almost got it in, in a screening room. This would have been great uh, I'll to have see. To catch up with it. It would have been yeah, great have to, to catch see up in with theaters. That too. As for what I've been watching, last time I started, I talked a little bit about New York Film Festival. Bring it down. Uh, the festival has continued, so I got I got to talk about some more movies. Uh, last time we spoke, I'd only seen one of the Steve McQueen movies, Lovers Rock, uh, which I highly recommended. Now I've seen three. I saw Mangrove and I saw Red, White, and Blue. So that's three out of the five films that uh, will be released in this sort of small acts collection uh, for Amazon. And I think it's interesting to talk about that as a collection for a second just because uh this is ostensibly a tv series like amazon hired him to deliver a season it, yeah. of television but these are movies and these are cinematic uh achievements right like this doesn't have the look or feel of tv these are entirely uh separate installments that one story has nothing really to do with the other other than the fact that they're all from a relatively similar time period and about uh, West Indies immigrants to London. Like, it, it, it's sort of got a consistent perspective, but they're completely separate stories, and, and each feels like its own movie. Mangrove is probably the most traditional uh, movie among the group that I've seen. It's this story of the Mangrove restaurant, and again, this is actually based on a true story here, a place that was harassed by the local police and frequently raided until wow. uh, until in the course of some marches, uh, several people, including the restaurant's odor, owner, were taken to court over rioting charges. And the first half plays out as this kind of like interesting period drama showing the racial tensions between uh, citizens and the police in London. And then the second half is this like riveting court case, this courtroom drama uh, given to you through the lens of Steve McQueen, a guy oh, that who, sounds who's going to like direct the hell out of it. You know, um, Letitia Wright here is dynamic, really great performance from her, uh, the kind of like fire plug that I don't know if I've quite seen from her in uh, other uh, performances that she's given. And, and it's a great movie. Like, I'm, I'm really into this one. It's a little bit uh, paint by numbers for Steve McQueen, who's a guy who, like, uh, gives you some kind of exp it gives you kind of experimental yeah. perspectives every now and then, but it's a solid movie, uh, one that's a pretty interesting watch and about a really interesting moment. Uh, I thought I was a little more the one that was a little more interesting is Red, White, and Blue. It's the story of this young man played by John Boyega, ah. whose father has recently been beaten by police, 
And meanwhile, he is signing up to become a cadet in training himself. And it's uh, while he's simultaneously dealing with his father, who is going through the courts to try and get some sort of retribution for the attack that he suffered, uh, he is trying to make his own way through the police and, and fix the system from within the system and getting shut out by these people who who don't respect him and don't view him as an equal. And it becomes this really intense character study of just the, like the weight that would be on a guy like that's shoulders. Uh, all, all the conflicting things going through his head. And to me, this is the best John Boyega performance I've ever seen. Uh, wow. You know, it really gives him a chance to do some some serious capital A acting in which he you, he's wrestling with internal conflicts, wrestling with out, outer conflicts with the people with his co-workers with his family and it ends on this very like downbeat note that just feels so right for this type of story this sort of unresolved conflict that we still experience uh in our modern times uh it, it might not be as satisfying as mangrove or as just like uh deliciously like fun uh as lover's rock was but it, it's I think it has the most to say, and I, I'm most curious to hear you in particular, uh, your reaction to it, because uh, it, it's got some really great, great moments in this in this one, red, white and blue. It's an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. So like it's it's a couple what? of them. I think <laughs> Lover's Rock is also only 70 something minutes. Yeah, because I was looking at so, Mangrove and, and that's hitting its two hours. So that's yeah, I don't know, that's so just interesting. a lot of these are shorter which makes it feel a little more like it would be TV, but but they're full movies and they give you the full story. It, it he gets a lot done in that hour and twenty minutes. That's interesting. I know we're going to talk about more about the idea of that being movies, but really it's TV and really it's streaming and it's all that. But Mangrove is considered episode one, and that I think they're coming out weekly. Mangrove will come out yes. November twentieth, and then weekly, you know, Lovers Rock the following week. Alex Weedle mm-hmm. and Education follow up, which I, I, I don't know much about those yet. And then it ends yeah. on Red, White, and Blue December eighteenth. So that's the one that they're wrapping it all up on. So that's gonna be, it's gonna be, pre- dude, a new McQueen project every week. That's dope. It, that's dope. Are, From the comfort of spoiled. your own home. That's yeah, crazy. Showered with luxuries right now. I can't. I can't wait to catch the other okay. two. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm excited. excited for everybody to get to watch those Steve McQueen movies. So, out of the three, though, um, Red, White, and Blue is your standout so far. You know, they're all good in their different ways. It's hard to even say that one is so much better than the rest. And I, I will be, I would be most likely to rewatch Lovers Rock because it's so pleasant. Okay, uh, it's such a vibe as I mentioned last week. But uh, Red, White, and Blue is the one that I'm. I'm left tossing and turning in my mind, you know? I, okay. I think it has the most to say. I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, speaking of shorts, uh, the Pedro Almodovar short with Tilda Swinton also played as part of New York Film Festival, The Human Voice. I thought that one was absolutely delightful. I mean, okay. I think you get an idea. It, you, it, it's Again, it's a really great exhibition for somebody like Pedro Almodovar who gives you these really opulent scenes and these beautiful colors he's done that throughout his work uh it's a really this is nice short package uh this was a movie that was filmed entirely after uh the pandemic started Mm -hmm. so it's filmed entirely under restrictions and I think either because of that or maybe it just is conveniently working out that way. Uh, it's a movie with only Tilda Swinton in it and no other characters. You you follow her. Uh, she's a she's in the apartment of her or she's in her own apartment, but among her ex's suitcases and on the phone with him trying to get rid of his belongings. OK, and you kind of see her sort of unravel in this way, this very performative way uh, that works because Tilda Swinton is such a dynamic presence and such a great actress uh, that she's just you want to watch her in these moments uh it's not that a whole lot happens but it's got some really great monologues and some really great uh some visuals uh it's got some clever bits too because it plays off of this idea that it is uh in a studio uh i I enjoyed it quite a bit i I think you would enjoy it too and if that's something that comes across anybody's plate i definitely would recommend checking it out especially because it's only 30 minutes that one had piqued my interest because i know it was just her and it had reminded me i think kate blanchett i know it's completely different but kate blanchett also Mm -hmm. i think hers was a feature length there was also just her but i think she played like different people or something like that. yeah yeah yeah, but here Tilda is just the one character, so okay. that also makes it a little bit different. Uh, but I liked it quite a bit. Okay. Uh, that was a short, and, technically. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, if we're going by Oscar's standards 
40 minutes is the cutoff. 40 minutes is a short. Longer than that is a feature, I believe. Okay. So, uh, to me, though, the standout of the film festival was the latest from Chloe Zhao, Nomadland. Talk about it. Because uh, this is a movie that a lot of people are talking about as one of the early contenders for best of the year. Yes. Uh, definitely a contender for a lot of awards, Oscars, and the like. Uh, this one stars Francis McDormand. I feel like it's been done for a little bit, for a little while. Uh, people have been sharing, like, there's this one image, uh, the first still image from uh, that film have been, has been around for a little while. But uh, this is a really interesting story about uh, an older woman in her, or she's a woman in her 60s. Uh, and it takes place, be, and it starts in this town called Empire Nevada, which is a town that used to uh, hold a sheetrock factory. But after the sheetrock factory closes, uh, the town kind of dissipates, and the zip code even gets discontinued. So we pick off, we pick off after that, uh, following this woman who, wh- without explicitly telling us, you can tell that she's kind of lost her her life her livelihood uh you know she she was employed at that factory and her she's no longer able to live in the house that she once had uh she, we we follow her in her truck with all of her belongings in the back as she uh moves from job to job and town to town and it just this really interesting character study uh full of these beautifully observed details uh, because Chloe Zhao is that kind of director who I feel like can really uh, bring you into the intimacy of a person's life uh, without necessarily being exploitative. She just puts you on uh, Frances McDormand's shoulder as she goes about her routine, as she meets these uh, different nomads and nomadic communities, as she uh, mingles with trailer park communities or uh, at one point in an Amazon factory. I don't know how they got permission to film in one of those Amazon factories, but they've got some scenes in there. And it's it's just a very uh, interesting story that I think would be a bit of like a Rorschach uh, for, for people kind of in, in what you take out of it. Like I couldn't, I can imagine people thinking this is like a film about uh, what it's like to be alone or what it's like to age, mm, uh, what it's like okay. to, it could be a film about what it's like to not want to accept help from people around you. To me, it's a film about like the, the declining of small town America and these disappearing jobs and the lack of like uh, a governmental safety net for so many of our, our aging uh, citizens uh, who like this woman who is still young enough to work but not old uh, not old enough where or, or she's still she's not so old that she's going to retire but she's not so young that she can just pick up and start a whole new career and she kind of doesn't have a place in modern society uh, and I think the way that the movie illustrates that mm. is really elegantly done uh, some beautiful some beautiful cinematography, a really amazing film score, which I found out recently is uh, disqualified for the Oscars already. So why does it use? That's depressing me. Yeah, it uses previously written material, which Bruh. one of my least favorite rules because that score is Bruh. so good. Um, yeah, man, I, I'm excited to talk about this movie more with you because I think you're gonna like it too. It's a lot of a lot of really interesting stuff here. Chicago Festival is playing it. The only thing is, uh, you got to see it virtually. Yeah. Well, I don't Drive-in. get. Th- I had to go. I had to pay a hundred dollars at the drive-in, which, yeah. you know, by Chicago standards, opening and closing films would be fifty dollars a piece. That's how much I paid for La La Land Makes back sense. in the day. Um, I might catch it. I know it comes out December fourth, but uh, hey, Chloe's got this. Which uh, were you a fan of the writer? I, I need to catch up with the writer now because I really liked this one. I mean, and to think that she's got what could be one of the biggest Oscar contenders. Then she's going to follow up with a massive blockbuster with Eternals. It's got a Right. enormous cast. It's it's like going to be one of the first really true international movies that I think Marvel's trying to do. Uh, that's also like a singular movie. Frances McDormand, the last feature film she was in, because I think that's why you were mentioning that the still has been around for the longest time, because remember, she won for three billboards back in 2017. Yeah, and I think do already anything. then people were talking about, yes. like, oh, she's also what's got gonna this be the, Yeah, what's going to be the next one? Because uh, since then, I think the only thing, she did a, a small voice in Isle of Dogs, uh, and she voiced God. In Good Omens, I don't know if you ever saw Good Omens, but this <laughs> would be her, this would be her first big role. So to come back and just with all these heavy hitters, I know she, I one of her biggest things when she won the Oscar was like I'm only going to take roles, you know, besides playing the Lord, <laughs> right. where it's going to be something massive, and it sounds like this one delivered. So I'm I am excited. I might pay that hundred bucks yeah. to go see it. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> 
It's, it's really good, man. I don't think you would regret it. I, okay. I don't think you would. All right. I also want to talk about another one of my mo- my favorite movies from the festival, The Disciple. Dude, I don't think okay. I've talked to you much about no, this No, but I, I was I was looking through your stuff to see, all right, what did he like that's going to be playing at Chicago? Uh, first of all, none of them. Uh, <laughs> but I saw Disciple, and I, I had no idea about this movie. What's it about? Okay, so interestingly, we got that question a couple weeks ago about our favorite Indian movies, and I said that I haven't seen a lot. But one movie that I have seen that I shouted out was Court from Chaitanya Tamhane, and I am glad I mentioned that because Boy is back. Chaitanya wow. has got another okay. movie. Alfonso Cuaron has been mentoring him. I learned this recently that Chaitanya was on the set of Roma, just like taking it in, learning what it's like to be a masterful auteur. And now he's taken that knowledge and put it into this new movie, The Disciple. And um, bro, bro, he's he's made like a, a slow, meditative Indian whiplash. This is a movie. Is about- your screener link still available? <laughs> 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 oh man, I wish, I wish, Wait. dude. So it's a movie about this like aspiring uh, classical musician, uh, and he works as sort of an apprentice to this famous uh, Indian musician. And it, throughout the film, he's kind of he's studying the greats and he's practicing and he's putting, you know, that he's got that same sort of like drive for greatness that Whiplash does. But the thing that's so interesting here in opposed to Whiplash is just like this movie refuses to give him wins. He just like, it follows him as his dream slowly withers out and dies. And I like, it's depressing as that sounds. It's just such a beautiful story about like, not everybody gets to do the thing they wish they wanted to. And, and, Yo, it, it, there's just some scenes where you'll have chills. At the nah, expressions brother. from this main guy are so right. Uh, and it it's beautifully done. You know, uh, it's got a cinematographer that was recommended by Quaron to T- Tom Hane. So it's got that look, too. Uh, man, I, I was just really, really impressed by this movie. I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's definitely doesn't have the, like adrenaline that you get from whiplash but that same sort of like uh i feel you meant that mental like difficulty that tension is is so present throughout this one i'm su- i was super super into the disciple damn i gotta watch i gotta rent court then <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay yeah and check out court if you can't check out the disciple because court is really really good and i think uh, a good indication of where this guy is going because okay. I, I think we've got a a really interesting filmmaker here in two movies he's blown me away i mean the man's like what is he like not even 35 he's around chazelle's age as well so yeah yep yep studied it's- under god on himself depressing Ooh. that he's doing this and we're doing a podcast <laughs> <laughs> i'm depressed that you were watching these movies like the disciple and i was watching some blumhouse stuff because <laughs> i got nocturne which again was blumhouse trying to do a similar with sydney right. sweeney another type of whiplash it wasn't there and i was like ah, i guess nah. i guess we're not gonna it's because i wasn't in new york <laughs> all yep, right yep. all right wow consider me um hyped okay <laughs> all right i had no idea what this was about at all yeah, I just, yeah. Okay, I'm excited. Just a couple others that I saw. Uh, I saw the documentary The Truffle Hunters, which was one that was also at Sundance. And? Uh, really, really like this okay. one. It's gorgeously shot. Uh, got the, got these really amazing visuals. And then you've got these this really interesting community of these Italian uh, guys who go out with their dogs into the mountains looking for... Uh, looking for truffles and it's it's mostly about the bond between these older men it's all older men and their dogs uh these people who are like in some cases they don't have a wife they don't have kids they don't have a family they just dev- they just live uh live to hunt her truffles and treat their dogs nicely it's really sweet in parts yeah. there is some like sadness that breaks through like we there's a whole subplot of like comp- the competition ends up making people like poison each other's dogs but like it, for the most part, it, this is just a really interesting subculture that I, I had never heard about. Okay. And it's captured just absolutely beautifully by these cameras. So I'd highly recommend uh, The Truffle Hunters. Another Sundance movie that was at New York is I Carry You With Me, uh, which I believe was Alina's favorite back when we were at Sundance. Yes, sir. And, yo, man, I, I see why the uh, Heidi Ewing story, uh, part part fiction, part nonfiction, 
it's it's just a very very beautifully articulated story of like what the what these two lives would be like growing up under these conditions and the balancing of the the desire to live life as themselves uh, with the societal pressures on top of them, whether that's uh, the, the homosexuality stuff or uh, the eventual border crossing stuff. It's just such a, a lived in experience uh, that she captures here that I, I was really blown away by the movie. And I'm, uh, I was glad that I finally got to catch up with it. Oh. I, I know you also really liked it out of Sundance. Yes, yeah, I really liked it. I know this one was supposed to come out um, along with Dick Johnson a lot earlier in the year. So hopefully it still gets a... Uh it gets a release because I know Sony Pictures Classic picked it up, so I know that they were trying to take this and and do some stuff with it. Um, but yeah, it's a beautiful. I know she doesn't like calling it a hybrid, but I don't, it, it's it's a lived-in movie for sure because yeah, it's yeah. still. I mean, it's happening. That's the craziest yeah, it, part. It, it, it's got Ella, even if it's got mostly uh, a narrative thing going on. It, it's so um, rooted in the true story that it's telling that. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like you got to it's it is that hybrid, even if she yeah. rejects the definition. I, I know. And the homies were there. They were there at the first greeting that because Alina Crazy. had no idea. She was at the world Crazy. premiere. She had no idea she was at the world premiere. <laughs> and uh, they come out and they're there. And like, you know, you, you know, you know, some lady was like, so are they like, are they legal? <laughs> Bro, she just said snitch. <laughs> Go ahead, <try laughs> snitch. Now nah, they're in here. <laughs> so I'm glad you liked it, dude, because. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious to see. um because a lot of people were demanding a follow up and stuff, and I was like, "Just let them live." <laughs> That's yeah, what the story is right? about. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, uh, the one notable one that I did not like as much is French Exit. This is the new one from Azazel Jacobs and Patrick okay. Dewitt, starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Lucas Hedges, uh, about an aging Manhattan social life who uh, moves into a, an apartment in Paris. Uh, I feel like it's trying to have this sort of like quirky Wes Anderson like Dude, look funny at these you say hoity that. toity people uh and how like how much they live in like a separate world than us and I just didn't find it funny I found it cloying and uh I, I found the characters to all kind of be a little bit despicable uh I just wasn't really I, I never really got onto this movie's wavelengths I was hoping for it to end uh I, I really didn't dig it I'm sorry uh a lot of people have uh, their hopes on Michelle Pfeiffer potentially getting an Oscar nomination for this performance and like supporting lead. She's fine. Lead. Um, she's fine. But, you know, it's one of those movies that I just don't think is good enough to support the kind of performance that should be Oscar nominated. You know, OK, uh, I, I'd like the movie to be better to really even consider her. Uh it, it made me not like Lucas Hedges, which is, I know, your corner, and I really <laughs> like him. But, man, he's, he's got, like, you, this dweeb I've energy throughout you, it. I've been telling you. I, I don't want to say it. I don't it. know, man. It's just, it's I'm just not, the case. I'm, I'm still on Lucas Hedges Island, but uh, not not for French Exit. I can't, I can't do French it, Exit. It's funny so. that you mentioned uh, Wes because I, you know, I keep hearing this movie's title, and I was like, Dispatch? And it's like, no, right. Exit. And I was like, oh, okay. I keep confusing the two. So it's funny that you say how similar it is. Uh, I've actually had a lot of Azazel's uh, movies on my watch list. Um, the Lovers was I one. like Terry. Okay, I haven't seen Terry, but The Lovers. Um, and then he's got another mm-hmm. one over here. Let me check. Uh, from way back. Oh, five. The Good Times Kid. Both of those have been on my uh, watch list. And I'll add Terry on it I as like well. I like The Lovers also. You know, yeah. I, mean, I think yeah, you recommended I don't know. that one to me. So, hey. He just doesn't have can't, to work with Lucas Hedges, you know? Yeah, you just got to... <laughs> no offense to Lucas, but... Yeah, yeah. All right. Can't win them all. Um, That's fine. And, and then we got two more from New York Film Festival, uh, On the Rocks and Gunda. Yes, sir. Which one do you want to go with first? Oh, we're talking about On the Rocks. <laughs> All right, so uh, the new from newest from Sofia Coppola, the A24 movie. It is in some theaters now and should be on demand, believe, by the end of the month. October 23rd. On that one. There you go. Uh, so on yeah, Apple TV it's Plus, a, it's about a young uh, mother reconnecting with her father. Uh, the young mother is Rashida Jones. The father is Bill Murray. I'm sure they have character names, but it's Rashida Jones and Bill Murray. Uh, and it's it's Sofia Coppola. So it's kind of a look at this very opulent lifestyle. She does not make movies about about people who don't have like full and thriving 401ks. Like she she she's got an, an eye for for the luxuries of life. Um, you know, it's a movie in which people apologize to 
uh, others by giving them diamond encrusted watches. And Cartier so, watches. You know, if you if you uh, if you're interested in that kind of lifestyle, I think she's one of the foremost document uh, documenters of it. Uh, for me, most of this movie's pleasures are in the the wry wit between Bill Murray and Rashida Jones, yes, two sir. performers who I like quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And I think they're actually a, a fantastic match for each other because I think both of them are at their best when they're kind of disaffected and affectless, right? Like they're they're, they're not so uh, hyper-emotional. They kind of can be dry yes. and ba- go back and forth. And to me, that's when the movie is the funniest is when they're able to be dry and uh, jokey with, with each other, maybe in ways that seem weird for a... Uh, what should be a father and daughter to be with, within the context of this movie. But, you know, I, th- I found it enjoyable, even if um, the story is a little bit thin. Uh, you know, she is worried that her husband's cheating on her and uses her father to try and uh, figure out whether or not that's the case. But I enjoyed spending time with this movie, even if it is uh, very light. I agree with you. A lot of people were very critical on it. Um, mm-hmm. And like you said, yeah, it's a little bit thin, but Bill Murray who plays Felix, and Rashida Jones, who plays Laura. Uh, there we go. They were fun, dude. I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. There's, there's the, the cop scene I thought was hilarious. He says this one yep. line like, oh, it must be really great to be you. He goes, wouldn't want to be anybody else. Uh, I, I'm almost, I, I don't know how much inspiration of it comes from Sophia herself. You know, like I, I just kept looking at Bill and I was like, yeah. is this how Francis Ford Coppola <laughs> right. is, you know, because he's supposed to be this super rich guy who also, you know, cheated back in his day, did all this stuff. And like mm-hmm. you said, because of the relationship that they have with each other and because of the circumstances with them being so rich, you actually have um, just like this openness that they have. And I mean, they're filthy rich as well. Uh, I know one of the aspects of it uh, uh, early on when they were filming was that flower shop. You remember the flower shop Ooh. that posted up all these different things because they did not want to or they wanted to get more money. You could look all into it to search it up. Um, and uh, there was like this whole big debacle that was happening because the flower shop owner didn't want them to capture it. Yo, <laughs> I'm sorry, the way that they shot New York and this looked beautiful. A lot of times mm-hmm. we get these screener links and they just um, they're not the greatest quality. And that's like one of the biggest like worries when you're watching a movie, you want to make sure you're, you're getting what the cinematographer wanted. This one's on Apple TV plus. So we got the screener for it through that. And let me, the streaming services, they got that down pat. The movie looked absolutely gorgeous. Um, and the way that it shot in New York, I thought looked fantastic as well. One of the things, and you had mentioned it as well, when you were talking about the Oculus and all this stuff, mm-hmm. I know, I know it, it's, I know it's thin, but Marlon Wayans who plays the husband, you know, we may have to have a little spoiler talk for this, but I, I, I think he he plays a good balance to that with what yeah. his character is uh, aiming to do as well. Uh, and I really did enjoy that part. Um, it's more of a funny movie than it is an emotional movie, definitely. Mm-hmm. But I, I thought it was a fun ride, literally a fun ride, because you're riding around with Bill yeah. Murray doing all this goofy stuff. Um, and again, yeah, and the stakes are pretty low. Yeah. It's not like you're terribly worried. Like, yeah, yeah there's a little bit of awkwardness, uh, you know, but... I, it's a it's a fun movie. Mm-hmm. I think it's a good it's a good stream. And again, I, I think the shots yeah. look beautiful on the street. They get some foggy New York streets, and uh, the flower shop maybe should have. Been. <laughs> <laughs> I do understand with the flower shop, but uh, no, Bill Murray was hilarious. Like honestly, he was really funny. He he had some of the lines that I've I've been quoting since the last couple of days that I've seen it. So uh, I yeah. give it a thumbs up. I, I thought it was fun. Definitely, yeah, I was into it. Too. It's eight twenty four as well. Uh, um, and then uh, Gunda, a documentary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this one first premiered at Berlin and went to Venice. Uh, supposedly, Joaquin Phoenix is a big supporter of this one. Paul Thomas Anderson is a big supporter of it. Uh, it it's a really interesting piece uh, directed by Viktor Kozakovslovsky. Respect uh, on that about, name. <laughs> um, about uh, just sort of daily life on a farm. It follows a pig and her piglets. You see some mo- uh, some some cows. I almost said moos. Um, uh, and there's not really much else to it. There's not like a a real story here. There's no dialogue. You just get the sounds of hoof hooves on the dirt and uh, animals doing their thing. And it, it's kind of amazing how they're able to capture some of the scenes like it definitely feels like they must have been at this farm for for days and days and days in order to get some of these shots uh 
the cinematography is just out of this world. I described it on Letterboxd as like if Lubezki shot Planet Earth. Uh, you know, you get these tracking shots where they follow alongside as the pig walks and the piglets all chase behind. I, I t- talked to you on Twitter about this one shot of the cow that very slowly cle- creeps in and lands right on its eye as like a little like tear falls down from it. I don't know if cows can actually cry, but that's what it looked like. Uh, it, it's such a stunning uh, collection of visuals and it eventually does kind of give you a little bit of a story and and that crazy emotional gut punch by the end uh i don't know if it's like converting me to veganism but like it it definitely made me cry uh i was i was surprised with how much i liked gunda i have been hearing about this since when it premiered overseas as well and it was that that mm-hmm. sh- that divide of this is an absolute an utter masterpiece and then other people just going literally just take your camera and go shoot some animals in the cow it's the most pretentious thing i've ever seen and i know it's going to be somewhere in the middle for a lot of people i know a lot of people may even like the message but they think the movie's too long um it is produced by joaquin phoenix okay there we go it explains his entire oscar speech now when you think back to what he said um this is uh the epitome of showing and not saying a damn thing Mm -hmm. um the director had said he added absolutely no extra sounds there is no, I don't want to call it ADR, but there is no sound effects. There's no Foley that's happening. He said every sound was captured there. He shot it in black and white mostly because he wanted to get the soul. He was very big on saying he's not humanizing the animals because he thinks humans always need to like personify something. He's like, no, what I'm trying to tell you is that they have their own soul. Is that right. these are, this is Gunda. This is Gunda. Mm-hmm. These are piglets. These are the cows. This is where she lives. These are all the things that uh, she does. There's no score. Uh, I agree. The black and white looks beautiful. He had based this off a painting. Um, hold on, let me hmm. see what it's called because I don't know what it is. In, I think it's a Norwegian painting. It's called The Young Bull. And uh, in that painting, it's all the animals are staring forward except the, the farmer. And uh, I was listening to all the, the interviews from the dude. He grew up in a farm. And he fell in love with this little pig that he had. Spoilers, I guess, <laughs> if you want to cut <laughs> Double tap yeah, right I mean, there, I get, the J. We I got guess. the we got the breakdown in the we bottom. Got the you can jump so ahead. I'm telling you right now. He said that was his best friend, and by Christmas, he was sitting right there on the dinner table. And like this man was really big on that idea of like he wants to seduce you with this movie. Again, he's not trying to tell you that these are these are do not humanify humanify do not personify these animals. These right. animals have a soul of their own, and like the stuff that he was talking about when dealing with. Um, just uh gunda herself like when he was shooting her he's like i not that he had conversations with her but like gunda would look at him and be like what are you doing (laughs) and it is a slow movie Mm -hmm. but it is one of the most beautifully shot i think the poster is one of the best posters of of the year and then you see the shot in the movie and you're like yo this is fantastic i know a lot of people are going to think it's pretentious but like i I like the way that he ends it because i was telling you i was like is he going to end it like this and he doesn't because then that would have been like I said a little bit of a spoiler warning. Propaganda. And he's like, I'm not making propaganda. I'm trying to make the purest of the purest. This man really, he does not believe. He says, if you want to tell a story, write a book. That's what he said. He said, if you're watching a movie, he says it's like a painting. That's why I brought up the painting. He's like, we have forgotten how to make movies is what he said. Um, Because you should be able to just see one shot. Like you do a painting and it should speak a thousand words. It should not be telling you what it is. And in a movie, it's not just one frame. It's 24 frames a second that you're watching throughout it. And he he is showing you this farm um again with with his own childhood and and what he carries there i agree with you man i was at the end i was like distressed i was contemplating some stuff and i was like this is a film this is a movie i know Mm -hmm. i know a lot of you have to have patience for it yeah i mean look he's trying to give you a slice of life and and what is life on the farm but like a meditative like slow slog right like and in getting to witness all these different things that these animals do their their cycle and you get to see a little bit of growth from the piglets like you, you kind of need to be brought into that world and to to fully experience the the final blow to for it to mean something 15 to minutes on that shot bro i went back and rewatched that i was like Ugh. 
greatest performance by an, by an animal. It's not even a performance because it is to, to a degree the a documentary. Um, but no, I, I I thought it was one of the be- one of the most beautifully shot movies of the year. Um, mm-hmm. Neon picked it up. Neon yeah. picked it up. Neon is yep. on a roll picking up these yeah. documentaries. And um, yeah, uh, again, I can see a lot of people thinking that it's, uh, it's a little too slow, but... It's definitely not for somebody who's looking for like a high pumping action, you know, like this, this isn't like a a blockbuster movie. No, Uh, it's not going to be something that plays in a lot of movie theaters. But if this idea of like giving you a a peek into what life is like for some of these animals and, and the idea of watching just 90 minutes of beautiful visuals without dialogue doesn't turn you off, then this is a must see, I think. Easily, and I definitely think it sticks with you because you and I have been talking about it and talking about yeah. life changes and talking about a bunch of other stuff. Um, he's got Find one. some Beyond Burgers. He, he's he's got one. He's got one. He, he's got yeah. one. That's all I can say. Yeah. And yeah, Joaquin uh, Joaquin produced as well. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we agree. Gunda is definitely worth your time. Uh, maybe even a little bit more than On the Rocks, but lots of really interesting stuff coming from the festival circuit, coming out of New York Film Festival and Sundance, and hopefully people are going to get more chances to watch these movies. I know we'll talk a little bit later about some of the upcoming virtual festivals, but uh, hopefully we've given you a little bit of a preview and you have some movies to, mm-hmm. to keep in the back of your mind as they start to come out. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, let us know what you've been watching in the comments on YouTube or by shooting us an email. The address for that is intercutpod at gmail.com. We are going to move on to the yay or nay breakdown. Some of the latest happenings in entertainment, starting with Disney's pivot to streaming in a new press release. Disney announced some structural changes to the company. The intriguing part comes in the line that reads, quote, the company's three content groups will be responsible and accountable for producing and delivering content for theatrical, linear and streaming with the primary focus being the company's streaming services. This marks a notable shift for a company that has had the most box off office success out of the major studios in recent years. Art, yay or nay, this is a bad sign for the future of movie theaters. A little bit. But what worries me more than that is Netflix and a lot of other streaming services have been building. And, and I get Netflix. A lot of people give Netflix poop because of the poop Netflix produces. But you and I love First Cow. And one of our favorite lines from First Cow is you either have capital or you have a crime. Netflix's biggest crime, I mean, <laughs> with a bunch of others, is that they have to put a lot of stuff up there to build. Disney can do all that in milliseconds and take over the streaming mm-hmm. game. You just mentioned how big they were in theaters, and we know what they did with theaters, and we know what they forced upon theaters, and we know the cuts they did to theaters, and the, and the, and the theaters that they took as well. They could do that with streaming, and I think that's my biggest concern, is how they're going to play the streaming game. This is a yeah. big entity playing the streaming game. It is worry on the- worrisome on theaters as well. A lot of people thought, okay, well, with Disney out of the out of the picture, then you have a lot more independent movies that'll be doing stuff. And I mean, I guess to a degree, uh, you know, those were the biggest box office ones for drive-ins and the independent theaters opened um, post the yeah. pandemic. But what, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's not like Swallow was out there making, you know, 50, 60 million dollars. You, you know, or- yeah, that's what people are thinking. It's like it's going to swap and be that. It, 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 it won't. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, we've seen Disney doesn't want to put their movies that uh, are huge blockbusters out without exactly. uh, some sort of some sort of money coming back. They're in. lying. Uh, we j- we just heard recently that they put soul They're They're planning to release soul onto Disney Plus uh, for free on Christmas rather than the thirty dollars surcharge that they experimented <laughs> with with Mulan. Um so it it makes me think that maybe they've decided like as long as these aren't the mega two hundred plus million and that's Marvel franchises, yes. they can live on Disney Plus. Does that mean <sighs> we'll never see a Pixar movie in theaters again? You know, like I don't know, and, and that's that frightens me. But I think this this is the thing that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks on this podcast of the the disappearing middle ground and how big how much bigger it's becoming how uh if there you've got the movies like the farewell that uh people like Lulu Wong really push to make sure they get into theaters because that that's how they get uh how, that's how they get their dues and how they get um 
the the hype to build and then you've got that big hole between stuff like that and stuff like Black Widow that needs to be in theaters or they won't make their money back and if if everything that costs somewhere between there only has a viable release strategy through streaming like that would be depressing because those are a lot of my favorite movies are the, those mid uh mid budgeted dramas and stuff like that uh yeah well I think we'll talk about it. Ho- yeah, go go ahead. I don't know. I was just like I'm. I'm hoping that there's still going to be a place for them. But uh, you know, we're seeing the the movie theater industry was already being squeezed, and it's only getting squeezed more and more by stuff like this. You know how Facebook says we want to give people the liberty to do stuff, but it's like, nah, you do have the ability to stop an avalanche from coming. This is Disney going. Right. Oh yeah, that's. That theory that you guys have about movies being divided, this is our chance to take advantage of that. The moment they strip their middle stuff to go over there, that means everybody else has to do it to a degree as well. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it def- not that it – I mean, it hurts theaters to the degree that you won't – it's going to limit it to just blockbusters. And everybody yeah. else, as we'll talk about in Topic of the Week with Netflix and others, um, they go straight to streaming. So, it's changing times. Yeah, and it's been interesting to hear people, like a lot of people on their press junkets recently, talk about, two years ago, nah, we're fighting it, two years to now, it's the changing times, and you have to adapt with it, and you have to this, and Mm -hmm. you have to that, and it's like, ah, it's a little, not hopeless, but it's, it's, you know, it's like, oh, like the fire is dying out, like, you can't even want that stuff anymore, they're telling you, no, pivot to something else now, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's disappointing. I guess definitely, definitely. It's disheartening as fans of of film and uh, people who want and movie to see, theaters uh, room room for different types of movies. And, and yeah, different types of movie studios. And uh, I think part of that whole Disney press release was talking about doubling down on their existing franchises. And you know, I think I think people talked about it's been the last time that Disney launched an original blockbuster was National Treasure in two thousand four. Ever since then, it's all been like sequels or based on other IP and remakes wow. and stuff like that. And, uh, it, it just <laughs> It sucks to think about a world where even Disney doesn't want to put out an original movie. They they haven't. Like, I didn't know it was that long, but, like, they haven't. Disney also has announced the director for the upcoming sequel to the remake of The Lion King. Who is Moonlight it? and If Beale Street Could Talk director Barry Jenkins. Uh, Art, let's keep this simple. Yay or nay, you are happy to see the gig go to Barry. I am happy to see Barry get money. I cannot deny that when everybody else gets to get their money i am happy that barry gets to have it one little thing Mm -hmm. i wanted to see that box set when he finished his career to have all of his movies from you know what was his first one because i haven't caught his first one yet medicine for melancholy great movie moonlight beale street uh jordan peele said the same thing delete my number i want it to be get out us i want it to be an original set i don't think it taints it and part of me do you have a theory do you think it might be something else i know they're saying it's connected but he said not a prequel not a whatever what it what what if it's like a what if it's a broadway did some crazy stuff with the adaptation so what if yeah i don't know what if it's something else i feel like I feel like he's just kind of it, that sounds like director speak to me that it's like, oh, Could we're be. not continuing the story, but it's going to be a story in the same place with the same cast. And I know. Characters. I know. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep optimistic because it, the, this movie will not be beholden to remaking a movie that people already like, right? Like now he can kind of do whatever. It just has to take place within this world. Maybe there's a chance for it to improve on uh, the John Favreau version. I, I, I've speculated that on Twitter. I don't know if I believe that either. Uh, I, I'm I'm in the same boat as you. You know, it's it's great to see a guy like Barry Jenkins Hell who yeah. has dedicated his career yes. to telling under undertold stories, to giving voice to under. Uh, underrepresented ideas who even when he got the bag from Amazon he's doing that to make an underground railroad show like Barry Barry Jenkins is probably deserving of a break yeah from depicting some of these heavy subjects that he's uh done throughout his career but you know also like you I am somewhat upset about the idea that I'm not really looking forward to a Barry Jenkins movie now. Uh, and that, I still am. It would take a lot to say that, but I, I don't know, man. We'll wait till I, we see I, the trailer, I'm looking of forward to the rest of his movies. For sure. Not this particular one. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. 
Watch it like yeah. watch he kills it. Watch it's like the most transformative right. thing we've seen in our life. Like it's an actual <laughs> true independent film with a two hundred million dollar budget. Look, it's got oh. a great cast already. Uh, maybe they can improve the visuals from the first one. <sighs> Look, this has been discussed since Joker, right? With Joker, yeah, everyone said you're going to have to tell your stories in the form of a cosplayed superhero right. big budget franchise. But you can still tell your intimate story. You just need to put it with characters that people love. Yeah. I think that's what this will end up being. It's still I it's hope. worth it for that Twitter video of Lulu Wong holding up their dog. I think that was great. I wish him the best. I wish him the best. Yeah, same. James McAvoy and Claire Voy have signed on to a new thriller called My Son, a remake of the 2017 French movie Mon Garçon. The movie will be helmed by French director Christian Carion, who directed the original as well. In the movie, McAvoy plays a father whose son goes missing, leading him and his ex-wife to search for answers. However, in order for McAvoy to embody a man trying to solve a mystery, McAvoy will not be given a script or any dialogue. Instead, as was the case for the original, original French film McAvoy will have to improvise as each scene um, develops and do the detective work as the scenes unfold art. Yay or nay. Yes. Do you think, do you think James McAvoy is good at escape rooms? I'm about to find out. I'm, I'm up for, I like James. I like Jimmy. You know, I haven't seen Surge. I, like him. I haven't seen Surge, which I know also had, uh, was it Winch- Wishaw? W- Wishaw? I believe it was Ben Wishaw. Yeah. Yeah. That's when this one had him going crazy, right? I haven't seen that one, yeah. but I saw Trance. And this man can go bonkers on some stuff. I've, I've seen him in Split. I've seen him. I do like James McAvoy. I'm curious yeah. to see what he does. Who's the director? Did it say? Uh, Christian Carrion. Okay. Uh, I think it's his English language debut. I'll be there. Streaming day one or <laughs> wherever it comes out. Uh, it's an intriguing idea, but it also, like, what happens if they need to do a second take? You know? Like, it. <laughs> It, it, hey, what I, happens I if know. Tom Cruise it, dies in space? I don't know, Zach, but in the name <laughs> of cinema, we will do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I don't think acting and improvising are necessarily the same skill. So no. I don't know if I'm like it's fully not. ready it's, to say this is going to be a yeah. success. But it's an it's interesting really experiment. I'm definitely down to experiment. Mm-hmm. That sounds cool. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah. Pluto TV, the free ad-supported Viacom CBS streaming service, will be offering all five seasons of Netflix's Narcos on their service. That means if you've wanted to check out some of Netflix's most popular show, but somehow still don't have a Netflix account, you'll be able to watch it for free, but with ads. What makes this so interesting is that it's a rare instance of Netflix allowing one of their shows on a platform form other than their own. Art, yay or nay, do you think this Netflix experiment will allow other original programming to be licensed by other networks. Oh, I don't know. What did we say a couple of episodes ago, Zach? I believe we said that it's going to get to the point of like TV channels where you syndicate uh, either a series that you have or television shows that you have. You cut them and format them for TV. It's now mm-hmm. just in streaming. Of course, 100%. That said, 2023 is the year. 2023 is is when most licenses for the stuff that HBO has, because, you know, like um, New Mutants isn't going to Disney. Right. It's going to HBO first because they still have that license. It goes up until right. 2023. Uh, I think it may be even closer for Netflix's. So I believe we'll have a period of time where a lot of people mm-hmm. are going to want to build their stuff by just, you know, keeping everything to their own, all exclusives. But then they're going to realize the how you make me, you have to have an open market you, you can't have these closed borders and i believe they're going to start sharing stuff which yeah yeah and that's cool with it and, and i'm always a bigger fan of, of being able to have it so that people don't need to pay the price and that you're able to again like tv series you know when you have a channel yeah you pay for the su- subscription service but it's the ads it's the commercials that are playing through there and now they have an opportunity with streaming to have pluto tubi um all the free channels that come when you buy a tv a smart tv uh where what's paying for them is the ads you're seeing in between and then mm-hmm. you know if you want the better experience you have to pay your what it, what is netflix now 14 bucks it, it is getting so. more and more it may be even more so i don't know yeah uh they also just got rid of free trials interestingly so uh really trying to make some of that money uh not, not give anything away uh you know we've shouted out the vox podcast live to the giants a couple times uh and one of the things they talk about that 
on that podcast is how Netflix has this crazy overhead, how they've dumped so much money into their original programming without necessarily getting all <laughs> that back in subscriber fees. We'll talk about it in 20 and minutes. for me, this seems like it's a new source of revenue for their huge catalog. Yes, sir. Especially content yes, that sir. they have that's just sitting, sitting around, there. right? Yeah. Uh, it's not like this deal means that Netflix can't play Narcos on Netflix. You know? It just means it's somewhere else, too. And, you know, it'll it'll be there for, who knows, six months, a, a year, however long. And then if you want to watch more, you got to go to Netflix. Mm-hmm. It's, it's another way for them to try and bring eyeballs to the platform. That's how it works. People who, who are like... They're like, no, I'm not going to sign up for a pay streaming service. I'm going to only use the free places like Pluto TV. That's fine. And then they're going to get addicted to Narcos or yeah. something like that. And then that's what they bank so the, on. The crack dealer philosophy. Let, let them get a little taste. <laughs> it's always been the model. Always been the model. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Barry Levinson is putting together a new film about the making of The Godfather with Oscar Isaac signed up to play Francis Ford Coppola and Jake Gyllenhaal set to play the legendary producer Robert Evans. Art, yay or nay, the movie that you want to see a fictional making of about is The Godfather. Um, You named a great cast <laughs> and I trust Levinson for the most part. So, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Because are we getting to the point where we don't just license sequels and prequels and shows, but the making ofs, the docs, everything around it, you know, it's crazy. And, mm-hmm. and just a, a side tidbit over here, because uh, we'll have an interview coming out for with the boys um, from the doc from Sundance. The doc that's not a doc, but it is a doc. The doc that isn't a doc. Bloody something. Oh, uh, Bloody Nose Empty Pockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They worked on... Um, Oh, I'm blanking on it. The Sony movie that was also at Sundance. Wendy. And they yeah. shot a doc for Wendy. Right. They don't have the rights to that. It, it And it was just making of footage. They, mm-hmm. the studios own making of footage. So it's a very interesting thing. I know it's <laughs> not what you asked, but it's so interesting, the rights and, and, and everything and how much you can really expand a project where all of it is marketing, um, even the making mm-hmm. of of it. But I'm excited for it. No, right. I mean, if you're a streaming service and you have all three Godfather movies on your platform, doesn't this sound just like a a really great way to get a bunch of people to go back and watch those movies? And yeah, those are already famous movies that have a lot of eyeballs on them. But like if you're a streaming service, you can package that all together. And now it's like we got 12 hours of Godfather content for you, plus the making of. Yeah, it's the further... uh, intellectual property ising of all of our movies and granted you know there are a lot of really interesting stories about what it took to get the godfather made so maybe this will be an interesting story i feel like you know maybe this isn't like the the number one choice that i would ha- make like I, i'd love to see a fictionalized version of the making of some of stanley kubrick's films particularly uh but you know it sounds cool, and you've got good talent behind it. I'm I'm pretty much always down to watch Oscar I'm Isaac excited. and Jake Gyllenhaal and something. So uh, it sounds really cool. I'm, I'm there. excited for it. I'm there. Yeah. All right, our last one here. Paramount Pictures has won a bidding war over the rights to a new Cleopatra movie that will reteam Wonder Woman star Gal Gadot with director Patty Jenkins in script from the writer of Shutter Island and Alita Battle Angel. Several filmmakers have tried over the years to get a Cleopatra project made without success. The legacy of Cleopatra looms large in Hollywood lore because the 1963 version of Cleopatra starring Elizabeth Taylor was one of the most expensive films ever made, nearly bankrupting 20th Century Fox and changing the way that studios approach blockbuster filmmaking. Get a making up for that. <laughs> Art, yay or nay, will this century's Cleopatra also nearly bankrupt a, film, a major movie studio? Yo, considering it's Paramount, and Paramount has said no to Scorsese yeah. multiple times. Yeah. They, said, they said no to Annihilation, put that thing on Netflix. <laughs> Perhaps. Real quick, I want to see a Michael Camino, Chimino, whatever his name was, who did Heaven's Gate. I want to see a making of of that one. <laughs> um, yeah, yes. You know? Uh, but in terms of this, are you are you excited with the talent behind the project? I mean, you said it was a bidding war, and I, I like Gal Gadot. I do, too. I feel like this is supposed to be like a drama, and I don't know if she can carry that. Again, I'll see. Uh, prove me wrong, for sure, but... I want this to be a big uh, epic, and and I don't feel like we've really delivered on... We had a Ben-Hur remake. I don't think that delivered, and and I liked Houston, the actor who was in it. Uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings, I thought was 
okay, and that had Ben Mendelsohn to, to Christian Bale, so <laughs> those were bigger talents. Um, I don't know. I've always been a little bit hesitant to, towards anything that's a little bit like sword and sandal, if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't know if there's enough here that's necessarily going to get me interested in it. But, it, you know, we've talked about this all all the time, but I, I need to see a little bit more, I guess, before I that's fully fine. commit. Uh, I'm definitely not like amped for the Cleopatra movie. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> a I, day one uh, ticket. I, I don't it, know enough about it. It's just crazy because yeah. it's like what talent could have gotten it. You know, that with it being such a big bidding war, it's like what could have gotten it or what else when you're speaking yeah. of that, what There's else could have been made directors instead? who are who are interested at one point in trying to make this. So a bit surprising that they finally got it with uh, Patty Jenkins. But I guess, you know, Wonder Woman has given her a lot of uh, cred at this point. It's Cleopatra again. People were saying, what about other figures in history? And does this go back to the idea that, yeah, well, people don't know those people. So it's almost like Cleopatra is a franchise. Cleopatra is an iconic figure that you can make something out of. So I feel like yeah. that's another worry as well, where the only people who are going to get the budget for these big productions are going to be products like this. That's about it for yay or nay, but a reminder that if you want to hear a subject covered here on Intercut, be an inner cutie and send us your questions by leaving it in the comments on YouTube or hitting us up on social media at IntercutPod. You can also email us at IntercutPod at gmail.com. We're going to move on to our topic of the week. This week's topic is... Netflix's approach to TV, because in recent weeks, Netflix has gone ahead and canceled several shows, including a couple that had previously been renewed. Mm -hmm. Young adult thriller The Society was set to start production on season two before its recent cancellation. And the critically beloved ensemble Glow, which had already begun production on what was supposed to be a fourth and final season, uh, recently had its uh, plug pulled. Several shows in the first or second seasons, including AJ and the Queen, Altered Carbon, Astronomy Club, The Dark Crystal, and I Am Not Okay With This have all been given the axe since the beginning of this year. And while a lot of the industry has been scaled back because of COVID losses, it is worth noting that Netflix has added over 10 million subscribers since the start of the pandemic. You know? So, uh, Art. What do you think of the current state of Netflix's TV production? You want to run down the ones that they canceled? I mean, there's a whole lot here. I don't know if we need to get in every single one, but, uh, you know, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina was one that I was very surprised I thought it was doing by. well, you know. it was That's the spinoff Patriot of Riverdale. Patriot Act with Hassan, Patriot Act with Hassan Minaj Come, is a show they know? don't have a lot of of like replacements for, right? Like yeah. that was kind of their news show and it struck a chord. Uh, stuff like t- Teenage Bounty Hunter, Turn Up Charlie, which had Idris Elba at the star the center of it. The Teenage uh, Bounty one is, because uh, I, I caught, a, Alina saw it, but I caught a couple of episodes of it and I thought it was a pretty funny show. So it just makes me think if a show like that can't even get a second season and you know, I mean, we'll have a bunch of other ones here that I'm going to run down. It's like, are they not going to greenlight other shows that are similar to that? Um, one of the other ones that I'm seeing over here, I thought Marianne was a pretty good horror show. And the worst part is always when they leave you with like a cliffhanger. I didn't love I Am Not Okay With This. But I'm not cool with not finishing what was a literal cliffhanger for what you wanted it to be. Dark Crystal won an Emmy and less than 24 hours later got canceled. Glow That's was crazy. promised at... They're talking about a movie now, but Glow was promised its final season, and now they, they're not even doing that. Bro, talk about F is for Family. I, I know it got its five seasons, but that was, you like that show. Yeah, F, for, F is for Family is another show that I, I, I like quite a bit. And granted, that at least will apparently be getting its f- fifth and final season. It hasn't been like interrupted the way that some of these other shows have been. But, you know, it, it's it's a plethora of show, shows that uh, have some audience, have had people excited about it, and, and, I think, you know, especially all these shows that were canceled after their first season, uh, October Faction, ne- Next in Fashion, Mortal, Messiah, Osmosis, uh, you know, not giving creators a chance to really uh, fully play out the these visions just runs counter to the idea of what made Netflix so great, right? Like the idea was because... Netflix doesn't have Nielsen ratings the way that the network shows do. They can be a little bit more attuned to where their niche audiences are following the shows. But I think more and more we're seeing uh, they really only prioritize keeping the shows that have a lot of buzz going around. 
and, and not letting shows like this develop an audience because you, you know, you look at a lot of the big, sh- big hits. We were just talking about Schitt's Creek last week. Schitt's Creek is a show that really took off after its third season. And uh, I think the fact that it stuck around for a few years you is know? part of what built that huge uh, community of fans around it. Um, and it's it sucks because it seems like Netflix is not committed to that idea of of letting a show play out, play out the story and, and find some new things. Um, They're built on this model that seems to emphasize one, maybe two seasons. And that should be enough because for whatever reason, they've decided that's the thing that brings new audiences to the service is, is the first season of a show and not the third, fourth or fifth. I think it's like they're, they test the grounds and they see how many deals can we get out of it. Oh, not as many as Stranger Things. All right, on to the next thing. You know, because right. I'm looking at, you know, when you're dealing with TV, you always have these cancellations, right? We've And we've gone with these cancellations with Netflix as well. American Vandal was one of our favorites. That got canceled. And that's when we started joking. Well, if Netflix was known as the the network that was saving the canceled shows, who <laughs> saves the canceled shows from Netflix? Now, we had just right. mentioned how they're going to be... Um, distributing it distributing their shows elsewhere i mean there's a possibility that it can get picked up elsewhere they had canceled one day at a time one day at a time found its way on tv same thing with Uh, tuka and birdie which is making its way to adult swim for its second season really hey shout out to them that's dope that's cool um well yeah you know so that so there is there is the possibility that that another network can pick it up especially with all the streaming services that are that are coming back up what better thing than to market a show that somebody else had boosted up Mm -hmm. and now you can come and finish the society i'd say would be a big one um I was looking forward to see where they were going to carry that show on to the next, the next thing. Yeah, I mean that seems like a show that would be perfectly comfortable on the CW if like they wanted to pick that up. You know, and and maybe that's just where we're at now, where Netflix is kind of this big dog that can cancel off shows that other other networks would then have to pick up. But a big appeal of a show landing on Netflix was that then Netflix would have that whole catalog of back seasons, right? Mm -hmm. Like they get Arrested Development and revive it, but the seasons of Arrested Development that aired on Fox are still going to be available through Netflix. Now, I think if, I don't think uh, like, for example, with One Day at a Time, which Pop TV picked up, I don't think One Day at a, uh, Pop TV has the rights to seasons one, two, three of One Day at a Time because they're still on Netflix. And uh, that also disincentivizes some of these other channels from even giving uh, some of these shows a shot, which is a shame. True. You know, I, I really want to see what happens with the rest of Glow, which they, they had been setting themselves up yeah, for this final for. season. <laughs> Uh, it it it's a the kind of thing that actually is pretty disrespectful to your fans to to the community of people paying oh. for your service because there's all these cliffhangers out there now on, on these various shows. Uh, I know many fans of the OA were really disappointed That's with the way right. that show ended, uh, but it's you know it 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 it, it just prevents uh, these shows from really fulfilling their uh, their creators visions and mm-hmm. i i wonder if at some point that actually turns against netflix which for so while so long now has gained this reputation as being a, a place for creators to kind of have their full creative vision exploited you know ava duvernay talks about that uh they gave all this money to scorsese they dropped these huge deals for shonda and for ryan murphy to make tv shows and it seems like a lot of that money is kind of sticking with those big people mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know at first you know we made again there, there's the blumhouse model right the blumhouse model is he keeps it cheap and he lets you do what you want you want your creative vision yeah how does that work? Less money. The more money you have, the more people, more investors who have a say in what the project is going to be. So Netflix was crazy because they went all United Artists back in the day that were just given, you know, we had just mentioned he- Gates of Heaven. They're just giving all these people ridiculous amounts of money that other people won't. But the reason why they were doing it is because they want to seat at that table. They want to create a table, to be honest with you. They kind of have, talking about how other, <laughs> some of the biggest uh, people out there like Disney are now pivoting to streaming, the thing that Netflix mm-hmm. was known for, the thing that wasn't good enough at even some festivals. Isn't that funny? When Toronto wouldn't play the Netflix movies, when AMC would have the showcase and they wouldn't have them. Now you have what it seems to be uh, Netflix wanting to invest in only things that it either can get money for or recognition, right? You had talked about all of these upcoming movies. Um, The Hillbilly one with Amy Adams. Uh, We were talking about how, oh, is this going to be David Fincher finally getting his Oscar with Mank, a Netflix movie. 
at the end of the day, it's business, you know, and Netflix, mm-hmm. in order to get the reputation that it's gotten, now needs to pay back a lot of debts, a lot of money, a lot of investments that it's that it's put in. And uh, yeah. with that comes a lot of cuts. And we realize yeah. we realize that they're no different than all the shows we lost back in the day from all these networks that didn't let them finish. Yeah, I am skeptical about the idea of these cuts, though, because it doesn't seem like Netflix is scaling down its blockbuster business, right? They're still dropping hundred million dollars to buy a movie off of Paramount every now and then. Like they just bought The Lovebirds somewhat recently. Okay, uh, they bought they bought The Trial of Chicago Seven not too long ago, and they are still dropping these mega deals uh, to get like you know the Benioff and Weiss project or or, or to get. Uh, some other like big TV show. And while they're dropping $200 million towards Ryan Murphy stuff, like how much of that money could have, it probably would have only been a fraction of that money to finish the season of glow. Like, I I don't know. You know, for sure. Uh, um, And it's this thing where uh, a lot of shows are set up in this way uh, through the various guilds and whatever, where, a lot of people get these pay increases in season three, right? Like the, the actors are signed on for cheap. Before it happens. Yep. And, and it feels like that's all they're doing is they're, they're looking at the bottom line. It's like, well, this show costs more and it's not getting more viewers than it did in the first season. Mm-hmm. But I think that's ultimately going to be a thing that really hurts Netflix. When what, what One of the things we've been talking about is how uh, some of the biggest uh, assets for these streaming services are shows like Friends and The Office, Parks and Rec, 30 Rock, shows that lasted six seven eight seasons and a big part of why those shows are so successful is because you can really hang out with them yep. you can you can sit and put the office on That's what people want for days and not get through the whole thing and i think netflix is ultimately hurting their own business if they're not going to give a show more than like 30 episodes or something. That's one of the appeals of binge watching and streaming is really getting to hang out in a world for a long time. Uh, And to me, as just a fan of TV, as as a person who's a fan of seeing how a show evolves from season to season, that depresses me because I'd like to see, you know, what the fifth season, the sixth season of Glow might look like. I'd like to see uh, what... A, a sketch show like the astronomy club would have to do to sustain itself for three, four seasons. But uh, that just doesn't seem to be in the current Netflix business model. There's going to be less and less, you know, we just finished mentioning how theaters are changing. Streaming's going to be the same thing. We talked years ago about movies and TV are meshing to become whatever Amazon is releasing with uh, Steve McQueen, right? Their episodes, but they're movies. Game of Thrones had the budget of movies. So it's getting to the point that if it cannot make that money, yeah, you know, they're, what you said, they're not watering these things to be something. Um, yeah. So it's it's really going to be dependent on politics. You know, who's running the stuff? Like you even said, there's a whole other business side of it as well. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I think of sports contracts when you got a rookie and you know right before they're a free agent or what you're able to book them for. Um, but then there's also the side of how these productions and streaming ends up changing what gets funded, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting turning point for the business, and uh, I'm very curious to see how Netflix's reputation Mm -hmm. is ultimately affected. Uh, You you know, as you said, it looks like they are really going for for some Oscars in uh, this year, particularly since there's going to be, you know, a lack of competition. Could we see... Uh, Mank and Hillbilly Elegy really bring them some yeah. of the prestige and, and and maybe like once they get best picture are they going to shift again like I, I I wonder what Netflix is prioritizing now because it does not seem mm-hmm. like they're prioritizing niche audiences in the way that the service once was touting you yeah. know uh, it, it'll it'll definitely be interesting to see how uh, how this evolves we may lose eight season seasons <laughs> You know, yeah. unless it's a big yeah. franchise, we may not have little shows like The Office that could unless it blows up right away. But even like you said, yeah. you know, Breaking Bad was another one that didn't pick up until a season three. So right. It, right. that's could why you imagine if <laughs> could if you AMC imagine record on that th- season three? Or and something again, yeah, like that. It, it's always been like that. That's always been the name of the game. But yeah, I agree with you. It's we're just getting to that point with the way that we're meshing movies and TV on. Is it just going to be these miniseries? Are we going to go right the route of Are Netflix? We 
Are we going to lose TV shows and movies and just end up with miniseries? Miniseries of I some sorts. You know, it really switches the way we see things. I mean, they, they switched the model to be binging, right? You know, at first they had said, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're Netflix, we're never going to do ads. All right, that's cool. You're just going to do a deal with Pluto <laughs> TV to do your stuff with ads. Sure. I know you get a cut from that. Is yeah. it going to change also the, uh, the idea of not only what gets funded, but also how they're going to make this stuff, you know? What are they going mm-hmm. to give money to unless it can become something bigger? And are they going to switch their stuff from binging to Amazon? Did not release the boys all at once. They released it weekly. Why? Just like we just said, when you have a product, you have it when it comes out at the box office. You have its theater run. Then you have it coming out on, on DVD. Then you have it syndicated for something else. Then they were going to streaming. When you're blowing your load all at once... You're going to have the bigger companies who come in and say, "Ah, you're not going to change the old ways. The old ways is Amazon releasing weekly, the Mandalorian releasing weekly. The way that Peacock came up right right from the bat, they said, our free version is ads. Then we got the premium one. And the stuff is weekly. So unless Netflix, which has done it in the past, goes back to weekly, um, it is how you're able to maximize your profits out of a thing. And you can maximize your profits when not everything is in one. A lot of people who are watching The Boys... Came to see the first three episodes. You know me. I want to catch it up all at once. A lot of people ended up with an Amazon account for two and a half months. And they could have just gotten the Amazon account at the end. Um, But that's the name of the game. It's how do you maximize your profits when it comes to streaming. And someone has the answer already. We'll be covering it as it rolls out. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, we'll, We'll definitely be very curious to see how this evolves. And uh, we'll continue talking about it and giving whatever insights we have, because it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's it, We've already witnessed so much change, and obviously the pandemic has changed things even more. Escalated uh, them. We're going to end up with a different entertainment industry on the other side of it. So, Yep. yep. Everything's a miniseries. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So let us know your thoughts on Netflix and how Netflix is approaching its business. Uh, are we destined for a world of only miniseries? They let got us rid know of the, the 20 comments. episodes. Social media, hit us up on intercutpod at gmail, however you want to do that. Uh, we're going to head to our last segment, the new to see, where we pick you, give you our picks for the week. Art, what should the people at home watch? Uh, let me see what I've got. Uh, since the last time we talked, obviously Blind Manor is out, and you can go catch all of that miniseries, uh, season one miniseries. I mean, they're doing it, you know? It's not a season two. It's a season one, again. Right. Um, but like it's I, the Haunting Collection. It's the Haunting Collection. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's how they're they're organizing it. Where it's it's not even a season one, season two. It's it's that like they, like they did with the Black Lives Matter collection, but it's the Haunting Collection. Everything's gonna be different. Yeah, they move fast. Um, Forty year old version is out also on Netflix, and I would highly recommend right. that one from Sundance. I thought it was pretty good. Um, and then Charm City Kings over on HBO Max, but definitely catch the documentary. The documentary was fantastic. Looking forward to making a video on that one. What about you? Cool. Uh, I'm gonna give a shout out to Twelve Hour Shift. It's a movie hey, uh, that yes. was part of Fantasia Fest yes, not too long ago. That one is out, I believe, on demand uh, now. Just kind of a fun little horror comedy about uh, this this nurse uh, surviving a crazy shift at her hospital where there's a killer on the loose. Uh, uh, it's a fun movie. Definitely check out the trailer. See if that one's for you. Um, I'll give a quick mention to Shit House as well. The the okay. IFC movie uh, th- from a what's the guy's name? The the twenty three year old writer director star. star he's all uh, in that. I'll search it up. But it premiered at South by Southwest. Yeah. Premiered at South by Southwest, an interesting movie. Uh, I think it's kind of trying to be like Before Sunrise mm-hmm. for college aged kids. Yes, and, sir. Uh, I think it it's more successful in moments, less successful in other moments. Uh, I, I don't know if the emotional core of the movie really uh, quite works. It feels a little bit contrived, but I think there's just some, the dialogue is really good. And particularly Dylan Galula, who I, I've seen in a few things. She's been in the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. She's been in support the girls here. She's absolutely delightful. I think she's going to have a, a fun career ahead of her. Uh, it's a very charismatic performance from her. Uh, you know, it's, it's a movie that I think I would have appreciated quite a bit if I caught it earlier in life. I, I think feel if you're you. a teenager. Uh, this is maybe uh, uh, worth it for you. Maybe not so much if you're less in touch with that internal teenager. Uh, but yeah, shithouse. Uh, it's a light recommend it from me. Cooper Rafe. Uh, 
Cooper Rafe. Yeah, yeah. Cooper. He's the one he's, who did all the, I think he's got something, he though. I, I'm, I'd be he does. very curious to see what his next movie is going to be. He does. Uh, was it produced by the Duplass? Because <laughs> this is definitely it in the vein like of the it. Duplass Brothers type stuff. I think it might which, have been. The, you know, it doesn't always work for me, but... Um, if it hits, I think it will hit. To me, I just found him too annoying at points. I was like, brah. Yeah. I was on her side the entire time. I was like, brah, leave her alone. Same. But I did like the ending. I was like, oh, this is this is going to hit for someone. Like, I, I enjoyed mm-hmm. that ending part of it, um, with it being a college movie and all. So, yeah. I, I know this one won big at South by as well. Like, it actually won the, the grand jury, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, yeah, that one will be out this week. Anything else? Yeah. Um, one more quick thing uh, is my... my this week's podcast corner because it's a little bit more than a podcast corner. I'm shouting out Song Exploder. It's one of my uh, favorite music podcasts out there, and now it is a show on okay, Netflix. Okay, I was, I was about to say episodes out. Yeah, uh, four episodes out. One with Alicia Keys. One with uh, REM. Another with Ty Dolla Sign. Uh, they got a, a really good one with Lin Manuel where he talks about uh, the the making of the song "Wait for It." And the the sort of premise of this podcast is sort of uh, exploding one song. Right? They just dive deep on one song. It's like a thirty minute podcast, all dedicated to the the production writing concept of one song. Uh, and one of the things that the host, Rishi Kirshire, uh does is he really breaks down uh, each individual element of the song. You listen to the stems, like you listen just to the drum part or, or just to the guitars. And he'll talk to the artist about like, why did they make the guitars sound that way? Or, or what is it you're looking for when you're adding uh, percussion to a track? And uh, it just, you get an insight into the creation of this music that you don't normally get. Uh, and you get some really interesting uh, just moments, uh, I think, in these interviews. I think he's such a good interviewer. Uh, the, I think for me, the Lin-Manuel episode and the REM episode were the better ones of the Netflix collection. But okay. if you think this series is, is interesting at all, definitely, definitely recommend checking out the audio version of that podcast. They've been doing episodes for years, so there's a big back catalog to select from, and That's they've cool. got some amazing episodes in there, too. Song Exploder, both the show and the podcast. They also just announced that they're going to do four more episodes in December. Hey. I think, uh, they're doing The Killers. They're doing Dua Lipa. They're doing some really interesting people on that show, so yeah, uh, keep it keep it in mind and that. maybe check out some of, the, some of those episodes. You know what's going to happen? Um, yeah. Netflix has Song Exploder. They found the podcast. They said, let's boost you up. Amazon's going to be like, hey, genius. <laughs> you want to take your little breakdowns and come put them over here? <laughs> that's that's what it's going to be, honestly. It, it's, it's, yeah. gonna, it's coming down to all the f- free stuff that you see on YouTube are just pitches that you're going to see, which is why we want to announce that uh, Intercut and Let Me Explain is <laughs> it's coming to Pluto TV. Pluto TV. Pluto <laughs> TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I also wanted to shout out, there's all these virtual film festivals happening. Yes. So if just started, um, you know, we've, we've had, uh, Toronto and New York, some of the major ones went first and, and now it's all these regional ones that have been popping up, uh, that are normally, you know, only useful to you if you are on in a certain region. Uh, but a lot of these have things that are. Uh, open to basically anybody who lives in the United States. I don't know as much about international. There might be some international options available too, though. Uh, stuff like AFI London Fest runs too. until October 22nd. Chicago International, which I know you're checking out, is going until October 25th. Montclair runs until October 25th. Indy Memphis until October 29th. Philly Film Fest until November 2nd. Uh, and they've got a lot of these interesting movies, the stuff that I mentioned from New York Film Festival and, and more uh, movies like Minari with, that we saw at Sundance. I can't wait to see Minari again. Uh, and I'll be doing that as part of Montclair Film Festival. I'm going to a drive in screening of Ammonite, the Sir Sharon and Kate yeah, Winslet movie. That's another hundred dollar one that I have to decide which one yep. I want to go to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, luckily, that's only sixty dollars or something like that for oh. me. I think. Uh, so yeah, uh, look if if you're if you wanted the film festival experience, but you've never been able to get yourself to one, it's easier than ever. And yes. there's some good movies out there. Uh, we've recommended a bunch. We'll keep talking about them online on Twitter and stuff like that. So you know, do yourself a t- favor and check out a, a film festival. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's about all for this week's show. You can catch more from me, Zach Shevich, by following me on Twitter, Instagram, or Letterbox at Z Shevich. That's Z-S-H-E-V, as in the fourth letter of McAvoy, I-C-H. 
and check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash multiplex show. Art, where can we people find more from you? You can find me at LME Explain on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, A to Z show as well, all that good stuff. But you can catch me every week here on the Intercut Podcast. You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or your favorite podcaster. I like Overcast. And then make sure you subscribe not just to the audio podcast, but to the video feed as well on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Intercut Pod, where you can watch our bright, smiling faces as we break down the latest in entertainment. Find new episodes of the Inter- of Intercut Podcast every Friday. Please leave us a comment, like the video, and consider heading over to iTunes to give us a five-star review. Shout out to our listeners in Portugal for putting us on the TV and film hey. podcast charts out there. Like our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. All of them are at Intercut Pod to get updates throughout the week from Art, from me, from all the guests that we feature here on Intercut. Thanks again for tuning in, and until next time, alcohol you later. <laughs>